It's the Pain Exam Podcast with your host, David Rosenblum, MD. If you treat pain or have an interest in pain management, join us as we discuss painful disorders, alternative treatments, practice management, and more. Be sure to subscribe to the Pain Exam newsletter at painexam.com and review the podcast on Stitcher or iTunes. Our high yield premium episodes are now available on the Pain Exam app with a premium subscription or access for free with a CME subscription at painexam.com. And now, without further ado, here's your host, Dr. Rosenblum. Welcome back. Summer is, uh, well, midsummer now, and um, a lot's happened, a lot's going to happen. So, before we get into the show, I have a few announcements. First of all, um, August 14th to 18th, if it's not too late for you, check me out in Mexico City for IASP, Mexican chapter, going to be teaching ultrasound, talking about regenerative medicine, and uh, working at the lab there, reviewing some lower extremity blocks and whatnot. So I'm very excited, never been to Mexico City before, so this should be a great course and conference. Uh, at the same time, unfortunately, I can't make it. I would go if I could, but I'll be in Mexico. My buddy, Dr. Al Abdul El Saeed, who, if you don't know, is probably the most prolific pain doctor of our era. The guy's written, I don't know, 50 books, probably 60. Now, every time I look at Instagram or LinkedIn, the guy has another book out there um, or paper. August 16th to 18th in Milwaukee, he's a WI. SIPP, Wisconsin State Interventional Pain Physician Society president, and he has this great conference, which hopefully next year I'll be at. It's in Milwaukee, and the link will be on the show notes. I encourage you all to check it out. He's a great guy, and he's a true leader in research and education, Um, so please um, check that out. Then we have Florida State Interventional Pain Physician and Florida State PMNR, that's FSIPP slash FSPMNR conference in Orlando, where I'll be faculty teaching ultrasound that Sunday, and I really hope to see you guys there as well, and followed by NYSIP, of course, in my hometown, New York, New Jersey, State Interventional Pain Society, or they call it now the Congress. So be sure to check out the links. It's also on the NRAP website. We do have a page for that. Board prep. Go to painexam.com or nrappain.org and you'll see the links. We have an app now and tons and tons of lectures, questions, and all you probably need for the boards. And then my ultrasound courses. I have regenerative medicine slash ultrasound two-day course in Manhattan in September 28th and 29th. You could register at nrappain.org as well as a monthly ultrasound course after that. And if you have a group of three to four people, you could do a private course or we could do private training on site where I come to you or you come to my office or we'll, we could work that out. But um, anyway, this podcast is based or inspired by a review article, more guidelines, I should say, from ASRA that my partner Gary Schwartz forwarded to me with some of the top names in pain management, especially headache pain management on this. And what the, 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 the title is Use of Corticosteroids for Adult Chronic Pain Interventions, Sympathetic and Peripheral Nerve Blocks Trigger Point Injections, Guidelines from American Society of Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine, the American Academy of Pain Medicine, the American Society of Interventional Pain Physicians, and the International Pain and Spine Interventional Society and North American Spine Society. So I stand corrected. It's not, not just ASRA. I mean, you have like some big, big organizations here talking about this. So it's long, and I'm going to paraphrase and try to get to the meat of this. So with respect to the recommendations on the safety of steroid injections and sympathetic blocks, the statement is sympathetic blocks may provide pain relief with or without the addition of corticosteroid in the injectate, and this is a moderate level of certainty. Use of particulate uh, corticosteroids and steroid ganglion blocks may cause central nervous system injury, right, because of vascular uptake, vasospasm of any blood vessel that feeds. Now, this is low-level certainty. I I generally use dexamethasone or no steroid when I do a a steroid ganglion um, block. Anyway, report reported pain relief after steroid ganglion block is similar 
if performed under fluoroscopy or ultrasound guidance. This is moderate, but um, they do mention image guidance may help decrease complications and improve accuracy of sympathetic blocks, including visceral sympathetic blocks, and that's moderate certain le uh, le uh, level of certainty. They recommend local anesthetic alone is sufficient for performing sympathetic blocks for pain relief. That's grade C evidence, and the grading system is, is there. And just to review that, grade C uh, states United States Preventive Services Task Force is recommends selectively offering or providing the service to individuals based on per professional judgment and benefit preference. There is at least moderate certainty that the net benefit is small. Grade B, just to review, there is high certainty that the net benefit is moderate or there is moderate certainty that the net benefit is moderate to substantial. And A is high certainty that the net benefit is substantial. Um, I know I'm skipping around, but D recommends against the service, moderate to high certainty that the service has no net benefit or the harms outweigh the benefits, and I insufficient to access the balance of benefits, harms, uh, evidence of lacking or poor quality lacking. Okay, but c jumping back to the stellate ganglion, I have to put my two cents in. I teach this when I teach my ultrasound courses. In the neck, you have a lot of stuff. Now, I trained... Actually, the first time I saw a stellate ganglion was blind. One of my attendings at Hospital for Joint Disease just moved the carotid conveniently to the side and put a needle between the trachea and the carotid, went down till he fit, hit bone, with, pulled back a few millimeters, and injected. You could call that ballsy, stupid, or cavalier, or whatever you want to say. Either way, that was, I guess, really old school. Um, super old school. I mean, x-rays existed back then, but he was a regional anesthesiologist, not a board-certified pain doctor with fluoroscopic knowledge. I trained in pain fellowship using fluoroscopy, but having a very strong ultrasound anesthesia training, especially with the neck and interscalenes, I was able to, on my own, and with the help, I believe I probably used Azra's website to kind of coach me and self-teach me, do the stellates with ultrasound. And I came to the conclusion that ultrasound is safest, it's best. I mean, it's a pretty obvious conclusion. If you're doing a fluoroscopic guided stellate ganglion block, you could wind up in the esophagus if you're off. And the only way you'll know that is when you get the esophagram. So I highly advise you to just use a ultrasound when and when doing this procedure. And if you don't have one, get one. If you don't know how to use one, learn. I, I, that's just my opinion. Um, I'm sure some people do this with just x-ray and they're really good at it. But I just don't think it's worth it. It's the neck. So um, a lot can go wrong in the neck. Okay, so moving on. Statements and recommendations on the safety of corticosteroid injections in greater occipital nerve blocks. So the statement... The, proxim the proximal approach has only been described with ultrasound. Image guidance may improve the efficacy of the distal approach to greater occipital nerve blocks compared with a non-image approach. That's low certainty. With ultrasound guidance, both classical distal approach and proximal approach appear to be effect effective for greater occipital nerve blocks, moderate certainty. Proximal approach may provide more substantial benefit compared with distal approach, it's low certainty. So there, there's no real major benefit that they're stating here. Addition of corticosteroid to local anesthetic improves outcomes compared with local anesthetic alone or saline when perform, performing greater occipital nerve blocks for patients with cluster headaches. So that's a moderate evidence to add steroid for cluster headaches. Local anesthetic alone yields similar outcomes when compared with a local anesthetic and steroid for the greater occipital nerve in patients with migraines and medication overuse headaches. So that's moderate. So their recommendations, use ultrasound or consider using it when performing greater occipital nerve blocks. Clinicians may choose either distal or proximal approach to greater occipital nerves, but the latter should be performed with ultrasound guidance. That's great. That's grade A. The addition of corticosteroid to local anesthetic is preferred in greater occipital. That's, that's grade C. Clinicians should avoid using corticosteroid in greater occipital nerve blocks for migraines and medication. Well, that's grade D. Clinicians should monitor and limit number of frequency of greater occipital nerve blocks with corticosteroids to avoid side effects. Well, that's grade B. And once again, just refer to this the link here if you want to review the, the grades or, or, or you want to slowly review everything I'm talking about here. Moving on to the truncal blocks, TAP, ilioinguinal, chest wall blocks. So... 
image guide techniques are more accurate. With ultrasound, one can visualize target tissues and pleura, while one can get better um, mark of the levels with fluoroscopy. I agree with this. It's high certainty, absolutely, right? You can label your le levels much easier with a fluoroscope, but you see nerves and pleura with an ultrasound. There's no significant difference in outcomes between ultrasound-guided and fluoroscopic-guided intercostal paratribal nerve block. That's high level of, of, um, of, of um, certainty. So now that's pretty interesting, right? You could argue that you could do fluoroscopy for these procedures, which I think is probably not as safe. Then again, let's look at the data. Patient-specific clinical data, including diagnosis, comorbidities, response to previous injections, and other relevant clinical information determine the frequency and number of blocks. Low level of certainty. Now their recommendations. Okay, this is all for chest wall blocks, intercostal and paravertebral. An image guide technique is preferred for intercostal and paravertebral blocks to improve accuracy of injections, grade C. Ultrasound is preferable to fluoroscopy for intercostal and paravertebral blocks because pleura and target tissue are visualized, grade C. Non-particulate cortical steroids are preferred over particulate cortical steroid injections for proximal intercostal paravertebral injections to avoid rare risk of injury of vascular uptake um, that may relate, re result in spinal cord injury, grade C. I have never heard of a paravertebral nerve block causing a uh, embolization of a feeding, a spinal cord feeding blood vessels such as Adamkowitz or one of these other blood vessels, and God forbid, ca causing paralysis. However, I use a non-particulate steroid because I don't want to take a chance. Transversus abdominis plane blocks. So ultrasound um, guidance are more accurate than landmark, moderate certainty of evidence. Transverse abdominal blocks pre pre preferably used with ultrasound to ensure accurate placement of injectate, grade B. I agree with that. Ilio inguinal uh, performed under ultrasound are more accurate than landmark, moderate evidence. Ilio inguinal injections with image based or landmark based have similar efficacy. That's low certainty, so I wouldn't really count that much. And they just basically recommend ilio inguinal nerve blocks to be done with ultrasound as a grade B. Um, steroid and recommendations on safety of cortical steroids in upper and lower extremity injections. So Low level of evidence using ultrasound for carpal tunnel has a, a small benefit compared to landmark-based injections. It's just kind of like a double negative here. They're saying ultrasound guidance for carpal tunnel sy syndrome injections confer a small benefit as compared with landmark injections regarding functional improvement pain. So it's low evidence. Using ultrasound recommendation is grade C. The lower extremity while there's high level of certainty that ultrasound guidance is superior to peripheral nerve stimulation and landmark-based techniques with regards to pain reduction, I believe that. There is moderate level of certainty that use of corticosteroid adjuvants in pudendal nerve blocks for, pain ma for the management of pain in chron chronic pudendal neuralgia does not prolong the benefit of an injection with local, then compared with local steroid alone. That's moderate. Results are better when Morton's neuronal injections are done under ultrasound with lamb, uh, compared with landmark. It's moderate. Morton's neuronal injection with cortical steroids have 50% likelihood of achieving satisfactory pain relief at one year with moderate evidence. So recommendations. Preferably, you should use ultrasound compared over the nerve stimulator or landmark when performing lower extremity injections, and that's grade A. Performing pudendal nerve injections, avoiding steroids as they do not give benefit is a, is a great D recommendation. So the way I take that is you can use steroids. Um, the, and I could be wrong, so read that yourself. <laughs> Morton's and Romer in injections should be performed with ultrasound guidance rather than landmark based. That's only grade C. And um, they're also saying grade B to use steroids for Morton's neuroma. So with respect to trigger point injections, Ultrasound visualizing neurovascular structures may result in more accurate targeting of trigger points in deeper anatomic locations. That's moderate certainty. Yet, CMS does not want to pay for ultrasound for trigger points anymore, and probably, the, the as usual, the other insurance companies may follow suit. So I think that is, you know, you don't need an ultrasound for many trigger points. However, it is helpful, especially for thoracic, to avoid a lung injury or a pneumothorax. Recommendations, trigger point injections can be duct, can, conducted based on palpation alone or with ultrasound may improve accuracy. It's grade C. 
so not here nor there. Clinicians may consider ultrasound guidance for trigger point injections conducted in areas high risk, either neurovascular pulmonary, like I mentioned, or visceral tissue, or in deeper anatomical. That's still grade C, so it's also really not one way or another. The addition of corticosteroid to local anesthetic does not result in increased benefit that outweighs the potential risk. This is moderate certainty. Recommendations, use of local anesthetic alone should be considered for trigger point injections, and that's grade B, okay? So um, this, uh, I think that's pretty, um, you know, I, I, I have used steroid for trigger points, um, and um, not much. I, and usually if I do it, it's kind of if I know that the trigger point is near some other structure like a, a nerve or a group of nerves or a, a facet joint or something where there may be extra benefit to that cord that cortical steroid. Steroids are myotoxic. That being said, people inject muscles with steroids all the time. Um, usually, I not n no major consequence of that, but I, I've seen people come in with, usually it's from the fat, like fat necrosis or lipoma from steroid injections, which can occur. I remember one of the doctors, um, the sports medicine guys, he was very heavy-handed. He would give 80 milligrams of methylprednisone in just blind trigger points going into like the gluteal muscle for generalized pain, which I guess he was relying on the systemic effect. But I, when he did this on obese patients, I, I remember seeing one or two patients with like a golf ball sized divot in their gluteal fat due to the steroid causing some fat necrosis. So just be mindful and be cheap when you can. I'm a cheap guy when it comes to corticosteroids. Um, it's really something that the other doctors are going to give. You're, you know, you're going to give it the neuro, the pulmo pulmonologist, sports guy, podiatrist, orthopedics. They're all going to give the patient a shot of something probably. Before you know it, the patient's overdosed on steroids. So when you can cheap out with steroids, do so. How do I do it? My suprascapular nerve blocks, my genicular nerve blocks, my visco supplements, my PRP, my medial branch blocks and RFA, my peripheral neuromodulation, et cetera. So... Um, this uh, was a great review article written by some really big names in pain management, and I encourage you to check out the links. Uh, if you haven't downloaded the Pain Exam or NRAP Academy app, please do so. We're, we have a community there, which we're just starting, so there's not much there, but be the first to post, and maybe you'll be one of the top uh, people in that community. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Please review it on iTunes, Stitcher, or whatever platform you're listening to this to. Please share it with your colleagues. And if you're interested in contributing to my platform or being part of this or being on the show or writing a blog or some sort of other article or getting your name out there, please contact me. You can email me at info at nrappain.org or just reply to my newsletters if you're on the newsletter. Um, anyway, thanks for listening. Have a great day. Dr. Rosenblum is here solely to educate, and you are solely responsible for all your decisions and actions in response to any information contained herein. These podcasts are not intended as a substitute for the medical advice of a physician to a particular patient or specific ailment. You should regularly consult a physician in matters relating to yours or another's health. You understand that this podcast is not intended as a substitute for consultation with a licensed medical professional. Copyright 2017, David Rosenblum, all rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced stored in a retrieval system or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic, mechanical, recording, or otherwise, without the prior written permission of the author.